So as we begin this morning, as Jake and I preach this morning and sharing with you the message, uh, sort of what we believe and, and how we're going to share the message of Christ to the world through our own personal efforts, through the A-teams and our and just our going about every day, the people that God puts in life, the people that come in contact with you, that we want us as a body of believers to be very welcoming, opening to folks. And so whenever you're going to grow, and that's what we're about, to go and to grow and to make and to to make new disciples it can be a challenge sometimes. Sometimes you can bring people that you may not know that maybe seem different to you. And so I just want us to always have a spirit of openness and a spirit of encouragement as we go through this. You know, there's a whole lot of people in this world that really don't know who Jesus is. I mean, they have an idea about religion and they've sometimes been turned off by it by religious people. But we are supposed to be the light of the world. We're supposed to bring light to darkness and we're all supposed to be the salt, the saving grace in this world. To being people who don't have a relationship with Jesus into a relationship with Jesus. So, but God wants us to make all things new as well. God's invested in making new things. When Revelation chapter 21, verse 5 through 7, this is Jesus said, Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, that is John, right for these things are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. He, he, he who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So God is making this promise to Christ that, that he is making all things new. As I was preparing for this lesson, it, it sort of came to me over the past few days, and we've been doing some reading on vacation, and, and my light reading is probably not anyone else's ideal of light reading, but things that I enjoy to read and I really scores I got hung up on some thoughts and then reflecting on some Bible readings and stuff I've been doing. I want to spend some time this evening just sort of talking maybe on a personal level to you and maybe some of your personal experiences. And I don't mean to dredge up any bad feelings or bad thoughts and stuff, but I'm suspecting in an audience this size that you've had some names said to you. You've been called some things, maybe some hurtful things in your life. And maybe some of those things still affect you. You know, I know that there's some people that were, they didn't grow up in godly homes. They didn't grow up with nurturing parents. And, and sometimes there's some horrible, horrible things were said to them. But people that supposed to have loved and protected them, you know, and sometimes, you know, you, you go to school or, or maybe you interact with people and maybe you just had some very just down to the, your personhood, verbal attacks given to you. So, you know, just in your life, you know, those kind of experiences. And I think to some degree that that's maybe universal, that people have some of those experiences. If you will sort of finish this old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words, they never hurt me. You see, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I don't believe that words can't hurt. In fact, I say it a little bit different. And sometimes in working with people and, and doing personal counseling with them and, and they've had horrible things to them, things that just are almost incomprehensible, someone would say to another living being. You know, and I'll tell them, I said, I don't believe the old saying that sticks and stones I broke my bones, words and I don't believe that. I believe this. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words they hurt forever. I've seen people just sort of bear emotional scars, deep, deep emotional scars by the labels, by the words that were used against them. And if you're saying, I don't know what this guy's talking about. I've never had that experience. God bless you. You have lived a charm life. <laughs> that God has smiled his face upon you always. But other people said, you know, I've had names. I've been called fat or stupid or skinny or ugly or, you know, or just horrendous things. Useless, worthless, stupid. And you hear those labels and sometimes we begin to internalize those labels and, and they begin to affect our identity. I remember preaching one time and I can't remember what child it was, but their eyes got real big and I realized I said something inappropriate in front of them because I said the word stupid. And their mother said they said the S word. He said the S word. So apparently they were taught in that house. You don't use that word and stuff. So, but whatever the experience was, words can't hurt. And sometimes people begin that to sort of roll that into our identity. And sometimes 
that affects them physically and emotionally and spiritually and you know and it begins to make them feel less of a person and less than i don't know why it is but we tend to measure ourselves up against other people a lot and we want to know am i as good as or better than or less than and for many people they always find themselves on the shorter end of the stick i'm less than I don't think that's what God really wants us to do. And it doesn't matter what the slur was. It doesn't matter what the derogatory name was. It doesn't matter what the slam was. You have been called. It is not true. From God's perspective, you are a wonderful, marvelous child of God. And we forget that sometimes. We let the world, we let other people evaluate us and castigate us. But God says different. God says different. If you are this evening a child of God, as Ethan became this morning, you are the child of the Most High King. The sons and daughters of the ruler and creator of the universe. I mean, if you let that bear the weight that it truly is, you have no reason to hang your head in shame. You have no reason to allow the words other people have said to you, to negate you, to hold you back. There was a Christian philosopher, Soren Kierkegaard, who said this. He says, when you label me, you negate me. You take away me when you do that. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, the psalmist says. Now, for sometimes we're more fearful than wonderful. But we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And God made you his own. New. It's amazing how many words we sort of throw around without always lurking the context for it. And one of the things I always keep handy when I'm preaching or or, uh, when I'm writing sermons or doing lessons and stuff, I have a concordance. It's a biblical concordance, uh, Vines, um, a biblical concordance. Um, and they take every word translated in the Bible and they tell you what the Greek word is and, and the history of it and something like that. Because I find that sometimes looking at words that we have in English have a whole new perspective when you look at it in the original language. And so this is a word that I never had looked at before. I remember learning the word when I had Greek class many years ago. I don't remember learning the Greek word for days, so I had to look it up. And it happens there's, there's more than one word for it, translated new in the Bible and sometimes new in its relationship to time. But this word new that was used in the book of Revelation and many times in scriptures is the word kanos. It denotes new of that which is unaccustomed or unused. Not new in time, but new as to former quality of a different nature from what is contrasted as old. Uh, My old truck, uh, Tammy, got somewhat conscientious riding it. She said it makes a lot of noise as you drive it. And it does. It squeaks and pops, makes a lot of noise. And she said... She envisions that one day just falling in half as we're going down the highway. So she said, you got to get you something more reliable because I travel a little bit. You got to get some more reliable. So, so I, I went on a look. So I didn't want to buy a new car. So I got a new van, but it's not a new van, but it's new to me, but it has a previous owner. So in this context, that's not new. It's used. But in the biblical context, new means never before, unaccustomed, not belonging to anything else. So, so God has in this ideal of kindness, Brand spanking new. It's not just new to you, but it's new, new. Man spanking new. Now, as I began understanding that concept of the word new, how the Greeks understood it, then I began sort of throwing around in my mind today sort of some of the things people are saying about what God's going to do in times. I began realizing that people who say some of these strange things don't know what the word new means. They need to go back to what the biblical concept of new meant. Not, not reconditioned, not refurbished, not re, reworked, but brand spanking new. In times to come, we're going to be looking at Jesus talking about new cloth and new wineskins and, and the implication of that, but that's in future lessons. So in Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 2, guess what? This word shows up again. John says, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Now, there's a lot of strange stuff being thrown out today. And sometimes some people in our fellowship are saying some really strange things about God. Oh, he's not going to destroy the earth. He's going to renew the earth. He's going to make it new again. Well, no, that's not what John says. And definitely not what Peter says. Peter says everything that you know is going to be fire. It's fodder for the fire. 
So John says, Kanos, new heaven, new earth, not renewed, but brand new, never before. A new heaven, new earth, for the first heaven and first earth have passed away, and also there is no more sea. And that'd be a strange world, wouldn't it? We spent a week in the ocean, just can't comprehend a world without a sea. But then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, again, Kanos, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So God is into new. When God says new, he means new. Right? When God says new, he means new. Okay. Brand spanking new. Now, the other day I took my new to me van, you know, and had it washed before we went on a trip, you know, and he says, what fragrance do you want? What do I ask for? New car smell. It didn't smell like a new car. I don't know what they call it. You know, I don't know what, but he didn't. I thought, was well, it going to smell brand new? No, it didn't. It had a funky, funky sort of smell for a couple of days, but it wasn't a new car smell. I don't know what, I don't know how you get the new car smell. You buy new cars, like that. but somehow they think they get the fragrance of it. But when God says new, he means new. Okay. Now I'm not losing you, am I? Because I know I've changed to going a little bit. Because I'm talking about the names you've been called, how that God thinks you're special. And that, you know, that, that when God says new, he needs new. Kainos means new, unaccustomed, never before. You know, this is very, very important. You understand this? Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17, Isaiah, even in the days of Isaiah, Isaiah said this. Now, he would have been using Hebrew, not a Greek common word, but he says, For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and a former shall not be remembered or come to mind. God's pretty clear on this to his prophets, to his inspired writers, that God's not going to renew this old stuff. He's going to start all over brand spanking new. Did you know that God has reserved a new name for each of his children? Whatever you go by, you know, in Tammy's family, they all had nicknames. And like, you know, my family, we weren't too much on nicknames. You know, they called you, you know, my poor mom, she would go through every child before she got to me, you know. And the closest she ever got to my name most time was Markle. You know, combination between Mark and Michael and stuff. And I mean, she, Tammy's heard her. She calls me Markle still to this day. She's you know, Markle. And stuff. So my name's not Mark, it's Mark, you know, but, but my poor mom struggled with having five kids. And, and I was usually the one that had me calm down the most, I believe. So, But maybe you had a special name. Maybe you had a pet name in your family. Maybe you had something that you went by and it, it was special. It's precious to you. You know, when someone used it, it was a term of endearment, not a, a term of derision. You know, how many had a pet name, a special name? Many of you did. Yeah. You know, Polly. <laughs> we all call her Polly. <laughs> her name's not Polly. <laughs> so, yeah. But, you know, Jesus paints this wonderful picture in talking to John when John was out of Patmos that he says, listen, you know, to those, to those who overcome, to those who remain faithful, I have all these wonderful things they're going to experience. And he tells the people of the seven churches, and I think universally to us, specifically to those churches, but universally the promises to each of us. But in the book of Revelation, this is really, really neat. Really, really neat. In chapter 2, verse 17. And he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone. And on the white stone, a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. So John talks in the physical terms. Jesus talks in physical terms because that's the physical world we live in. And can you imagine the manna? Someone says they were promised a portion of the manna. Wow, that's what it was like. You know? And then we're promised that you have a new name. Not one you've ever been called before. Not even a pet name. Not a term of endearment. Not, not even a term of derision. But a new name that is you. That you will recognize. That you will embrace. That God has reserved for you. You've never heard it before. But when you hear it, you'll know, that's my name. That's me. It's written in a testament on a stone. Did you know that God has always been about creating new connections? God loves you so much. He knows everything there is about you. He knows you for the moment. You were conceived. He has known you every moment of your life. And I've said it many, many times, but I want to say it again tonight. 
There has never been a solitary second, not a moment, not a fraction of a second, not a middle of a second, not the smallest parcel of a moment of time that you can measure with a human way of measurement that God has not loved you. He may not always been delighted in what you were doing or what you were saying or who you were with, but he has always loved you. Always. And if you're a child of God, he has reserved for you a special, special, uniquely just for you name. As a father or mother may have a pet name for their child. God has a special name that is just for you. Romans chapter 9, verse 25 through 26. Paul harkens back to the day of Hosea. Hosea was one of the interesting characters in the Bible. Hosea was a prophet of God. And Hosea just just loved the man. He loved God so much. He, He loved God so, so very much. And so God says, Hosea, I'm going to give you a wife. Okay, great. Okay. And he says, you see Gomer over there? Literally, her name was Gomer, as in Gomer Pyle. Gomer was his wife. Okay. He says, I want you to take her to be your wife. But he says, but God, you know, Gomer's not a really good woman. She's somewhat of a prostitute. And God says, no, she's to be your wife. And so God has the prophet marry a prostitute, a woman who sells her body. And so they have three kids. And I never can remember the name of the first two. But the last one was lo Ami, which means it's in Hebrew, not my people. So I don't know if he came out with a different skin color or hair color. But he obviously said, this, is one, this one's not mine. I know this one's not mine. Okay. So that gives you an indication of something about her moral character. And then she winds up leaving him and apparently the kids and begins selling herself to the highest bidder. Who will give you the most to sleep with me? And God says, Hosea, go get your wife. But God, she's left me. And God says, no, Hosea, you go get her, but you have to bid against the other man and you have to have the winning bid. So the book of Hosea talks exactly about how much he had to buy his wife back for he says, after you buy her back, you are to be a good husband to her and love the rest of your life. Can you imagine? And God says, Hosea, now you get me. <laughs> because you've been this man that have loved me so much. You did what I told you to do. Now you know what I've been to Israel. I have loved her and, and she has given herself over to, to idolatry. She sold herself to the highest bidder. She's done everything she can to just profane our relationship. But I've loved her so much. I have redeemed her every, every time. And Hosea, this is who I am. I'm a God of new things, new promises, new covenants. But he also says to Hosea, Paul saying, God says, Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people and her beloved who was not beloved. And it should come to pass in the place where it said to them, you're not my people there. They shall be called the sons of a living God. Now, look to the left of you or look to the right of you. Look to your right. Look to your left. The people next to you. Okay. That's God's new people. Unless you can trace your lineage back to Abraham through your genealogy, you know, I'm saying you're probably not Jewish. Uh, we don't have a lot of goldsmiths and gold farms and stuff here. We are the Gentiles. We're the people who are not God's people. Who God said to Hosea, one of these days, I'm going to do people who were not beloved, and they will be my beloved. I'll turn the people who are not my people into my people. So that's what God is about. He's about choosing the people that other people rejected. He's about choosing the people who other people had castigated. He's about choosing the people other people had labeled and named. And God chose you and God chose me to be his people. Revelation chapter 12, verse 22. But there shall be no means enter to anything that defiles. That is referring to heaven or causes an abomination or lie. But only those are written in the Lamb's book of life. Remember what we read in Revelation chapter 2? That God had a special name for you. As I begin reading and studying, I wonder if the name written in the Lamb's Book of Life that was written early in when I was baptized, 12 years old, was my new name. 
Was that the name that God recorded? This afternoon when Ethan was baptized, did God write Ethan? Or did he write Ethan's new name that only Ethan will know? it will be uniquely him for all eternity. See, Ethan was a name his family gave him. But God has a name for him. And God has a name for you. So in the Lamb's Book of Life, which name's written? Is it the name my parents gave me? Apparently when my mom and dad had, that was a surprise. They weren't going to have any more kids. They already had three kids. Seven years later, my mom decides, oh, she's pregnant. So I'm going to, oh. So the problem with having older siblings, they get to name the baby. I guess it's sort of like a puppy. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So they came up with Mark, which was okay. something like that. So, but my brother was studying Julius Caesar in high school. So guess what I get called? Mark Anthony. Because my brother was studying Julius Caesar in high school. So my middle name's Anthony. So I don't know, you know, I don't know if that's God. So that's the name for him. We got to know I've got another. He can go with that for a while, but I got another name for him. But the promise is that your name is already recorded if you're a child of God. It's, it's important to know that God, I don't care what your experience has been in life, God has something new planned for you. I don't know if you're sitting here not thinking, well, my life's done over. There's nothing new to look for. There's no new experience more. I'm telling you, there is a lot ahead of you. And it's because God makes all things new. Revelation chapter 12, verse 27. I read that passage earlier. But we are to recognize that only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life are those who have a hope. The ones in whom have recorded the new name. And I guess as we bring this lesson sort of down to that, have you claimed your new name? If you've never confessed as your Savior, you've never been buried in baptism, you've not claimed your new name yet. It's not that God's going to run out of names. I remember when uh, we were pregnant with Evan. I should say Tammy was pregnant. I wasn't, but we were expecting a new baby. So, yeah. I remember we, we bought a book of names. And, you know, we wanted a special name and stuff. So my father's name was John. And then John happens in her family. That Michael's actually John Michael. And her grandpa was John. But my problem was my older brothers and sisters already sort of claimed every derision of John. My brother named his son Jonathan. And so then my sister named her oldest son Sean, which is Irish for John. You know, so. But then I came across in the name book that the name of Evan is actually Welsh for John. And so Evan, so we sort of kept the family thing, then got Tammy's middle name. So it was, it was actually a Welsh derivative of the name John. So we choose our names for special reasons. And God has a chosen a special name for each of his children. Very, very sobering thought. Revelations chapter 20, verse 15. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. It's a scary thing to think about the number of folks that we know and care about who don't have a relationship with Jesus. That's what we do here so critically important, to bring people to knowledge of a God who loves them and a Savior who died for them and a family they can belong to <laughs> and a future in which God knows them enough that He's chosen a new name for them. I firmly believe that when the day comes, when you hear that new name, you will know it immediately. It will be the essence of you. It will be the sweetest sound in your ear to hear your name called. As I was preparing for the lesson I remember the story, Mark chapter 5, and it came to me, Talitha. I've never known anyone named called Talitha. Anyone known anyone called Talitha? You know someone? I think it's a beautiful name, Talitha. Oh, really? It's a family name, Talitha. I think it's a beautiful name and stuff, Talitha. Uh, it comes from Mark chapter 5. It actually means, anyone know what it means? It actually means little girl. In fact, it was Jairus, the ruler whose daughter was near unto death. And he goes to Jesus and says, hey, my daughter's dying. Can you do anything? Can you come to my house? And when Jesus gets to the house, people says, you're done too late. The girl's dead. And Jesus says, no, she's not dead. She's sleeping. And they all laugh. 
Because Jesus knows the soul's sleep is spiritual state is like the soul's sleep, and so Jesus knows, and they don't. And so she laughs, and then Jesus says to the Talitha Kumi, which literally translated, "Little girl, arise." So, in fact, for whatever reason, in the Gospel of Mark, the translators chose not to translate it; they just transliterated it. They left it tra- Talitha Kumi. So you have a little bit of Aramaic in there, Talitha Kumi, little girl. Arise. And she knew exactly who he was talking to. I remember the story of Lazarus. When Lazarus was in the tomb, and remember when he got there, he'd been dead for three days already, and, and Jesus opened the tomb, and they said, No, we can't, because he's going to smell bad. He's decomposing. And Jesus opened the tomb. And Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. Now, that doesn't mean a lot to us because we tend to bury people in a single grave. But in that day and time, people were buried in family tombs in which they would actually go and put the body in the tomb, come back a year later, take the bones that were left, put them in a box and put them on the shelf. And everybody's on the shelf, so to speak, in little ossuaries, little bone boxes. I remember Brother Charles Lemon said that he had to say, Lazarus, come forth, because he just said, come forth, everybody would come out of the tomb. Isn't that awesome? That whether we're alive when the Lord returns and we see his coming in the air or we're in the grave, that you will be called by name. And it will be the essence of your new name. And you will know without a doubt. That's what the child of God has looked forward to. That's what those who are in Christ Jesus know is reserved for them. A new name. So if you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, it would be a great opportunity to do it. We have everything prepared. Um, the, the garments are ready. The water is warm. Everything's ready for you. Uh, if you're here tonight and you'd like a prayer of encouragement, so like Sister Mary Francis this morning needed. So whatever your need, needs are, if you're subject, once you come and sing the songs like that.